Well, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to our annual meeting. This is where we kind of catch up and make sure where we are and also try to present some interesting information for our community and also give our visiting scholars a chance to talk about their research activities for the year. I'm Richard Dasher. I direct the US Asia Technology Management Center. And I'm going to start off this year for the US Asia Technology Management Center has really been a time when Stanford started to really come back from the uh, kind of pandemic mood. We're still doing this meeting as a hybrid, and we still have to ask people to join our public programs by Zoom rather than all be here in person. But it's uh, a big change from the way it used to be. For those of you who uh, haven't seen us before, this is, this is our schedule for today. So I'll take about 15 minutes and kind of give a point about where we are right now. And um, then uh, we'll have our keynote panel session and we'll take a, a brief break and finish up with our visiting scholar activity reports. So for those of you who don't know us, we've actually been around since 1992. This autumn will be the 30th anniversary of our public seminar series. 30 years ago, we started with a series of special lectures by Professor Fumio Kodama, who was very famous with uh, technology management in Japan at the time. And so this fall, hopefully we'll be able to do something uh, to kind of celebrate that as well as look at what's going on now. We were in the School of Engineering until 2017. And then in 2017, we switched and were put under Stanford Global Studies and we became an industry affiliates program. This means that our principal source of funding for all of our activities and operating costs are membership fees and supplemental support from our member companies. We're looking at innovation, entrepreneurship, technology and business trends, especially in Japan and Asia. We're doing some forecasting of the impact of new technologies on industry value chains. Uh, we're looking right now at manufacturing and logistics simulation. We're also looking at particular use cases of a particular type of artificial intelligence enabled analysis. Um, and we look a lot at open innovation management, especially in different business cultures, because what works here may not work somewhere else. Um, yeah, this is briefly for everybody's reference. We'll put this in the slides. Member companies receive items one through four for their annual membership fee, and then can engage in additional ways for separate funding in our visiting scholar program or to sponsor custom research in a topic of mutual interest. We can either hire graduate students here, or this is also a way that we work with member company researchers who have already been visiting scholars. Stanford has a strict two-year limit on someone being a visiting scholar. But if we have more to do together, we can work with the person as a research partner even after they go back to their home company. Uh, right now, we have 17 member companies. This is actually a little bit down from last year. But if you notice, of the 17 companies, 12 of them are engaged in these additional kind of levels of support, either with visiting scholars or providing additional research support. Uh, this is the highest number we've ever had. So we're seeing more engagement from our members, even as the membership is not really growing anymore. Um, I expect this will probably continue for the next few years. We're also looking forward to welcoming a couple of special visiting scholars this coming year. Professor Michiko Ashizawa, who was introduced to us by our former visiting scholar, Professor Takaaki Hoda, who is now with Keio University. Um, and so Professor Ashizawa will come in during her sabbatical year from Yokohama City University. We're also hosting a Fulbright scholar. 
And the Fulbright Scholar is a journalist who has been reporting for RKB Mindy in Kyushu. And he's going to be looking at innovation in Silicon Valley with us. So you also see how many of our current member companies really came in relatively recently, right? These are companies that have either signed up for the first time or have come back in um, since about July of 2021. So uh, for the member companies, we are doing a series of monthly meetings. We did 10 monthly meetings for members last year. As you'll see, almost everyone is involved with Stanford. So we ask other professors at Stanford to give talks, but not always. We were delighted to have Mr. Tomita, who is an entrepreneur in residence at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, come and talk to us about uh, business evolving around um, atmospheric carbon dioxide removal. Uh, you'll see the kind of topics that we're doing in the, um, the monthly meetings. They very much reflect our general areas of interest, but they think there are things that we think in a relatively small, intimate format, we can talk with our member companies about, and uh, this will be a benefit to them. But we're also very involved with uh, producing public programs. And we're delighted to have public participation in our fall and spring seminar series. These are weekly programs with uh, myself doing an overview and then nine, eight or nine uh, distinguished guest speakers from industry. Uh, in Autumn last year, we had 466 unique registrants. Now that does include students who were registered. We were completely on Zoom in autumn. And then in spring, we had 479 unique registrants for our entrepreneurship series. In winter, I teach a regular Stanford course. And this year, we went back and taught Japanese business culture and systems, which is a course I've been teaching since 1994. Uh, but the content is very different than it was in 1994. And next year, we'll be reviewing, re, repeating our course on rebalancing economic systems, along with Dr. Amit Kapoor, who is the CEO of the India Council on Competitiveness. We're inviting him to be here for three months and, and give the lectures. We are also doing large programs and presentations to visiting groups and other public appearances, which help the U.S. Agency Center stay involved. For us, five years ago is ancient history. We are trying to keep up with what's going on right now. And so we are, as you'll see, engaged in a lot of briefings, mutual knowledge exchange with many different groups. So our uh, fall series last year was on mobility. And very happy we had a wonderful lineup of speakers, including an Indian unicorn company on logistics management. And then um, Mr. Dagawa, who is actually a board, uh, who is actually, I think, the head of Intel Capital Japan, as well as being a board director for Tier 4 and the chief operating officer for Tier 4 a company from Hong Kong, a Silicon Valley venture capitalist, uh, a program that you don't often see when people talk about next generation mobility. What is the future of motorcycles? Uh, and then uh, we had a distinguished panel from India about uh, digital transformation and mobile communications with one of the CEO of one of their largest uh, wireless communications providers and also the state's think tank. And the picture is Mr. Saijo of uh, Woven Planet. And our final talk was by Hans Tung, who is, I think, number 36 on the Midas list this year of successful uh, venture capitalists. Uh, this spring, we are in the middle of our list. We've had China represented in a time when it's hard to find cooperation between US and China. Malaysia, a panel from India with one of their best known unicorn, company, uh, unicorn companies in the education technology space, 
and Pixel, which I think shows what's happening in India. They're a satellite-based hyperspectral imaging company. So very deep tech. Um, Tim Romero, who is head of Google for startups in Japan, uh, talked about cooperation between large firms and startups. We had the head of one of um, Bangkok's largest uh, kind of innovation accelerator programs, the advisor to the mayor of Shibuya, Shibuya City in uh, China. Our picture is Ms. Clara Yunjin Chang, who um, is well known. She's a former media personality who had her own TV show, but she is one of the co founders of uh, Stage Labs, which launched a new service in April and already has more than 3 million members. Um, and next week, we have uh, Ms. Prabhu coming in as uh, the advisor to the Assistant Secretary of State for South and Central Asia in the U.S. State Department, talking about uh, programs for entrepreneurship and women's economic empowerment in South Asia. Mm -hmm. So we're very happy to have been able to have uh, these speakers. I see a couple of our speakers are joining us for the meeting today. Thank you again so much. And um, yeah. Our course on Japanese business culture is also very practical. We are looking at the socio-cultural basis of business in Japan and do a certain amount of lecturing, but we had a special session about women on the board. And we had Ms. Ishiguro, who is former CEO of NetYear Group, and also Ms. Koshi, who is well known, known as the former mayor of Otsu City in Japan. And uh, Kimberly was kind enough to moderate that session for us. One of the big features of this class is that we ask the students to select American startups they think would do well in Japan. And they found four startups this year. We had four teams of students who developed pitch presentations to members of the investment community in uh, Japanese investment community here. And it was a great time. You're watching the group where uh, this team of students presented Alchemy Network, which is doing distributed finance, DeFi using blockchain. So uh, very interesting kind of course. Uh, we partner with uh, Japan Society of Northern California to put on the Innovation Awards. And uh, you'll see that we uh, have our next one planned on July 14, 2022. The winners this year have not yet been announced, but I know who they are. We'll have to pry that out of me after we get it through. Um, we won't talk how much wine. Uh, we also work with Keizai Silicon Valley, where this year I was able to host uh, their Shi Nenkai with uh, Dr. Mukai, who is Japan's first woman astronaut. Uh, actually, the first woman astronaut from anywhere in Asia. And we also partnered with uh, Silicon Valley Future Academy to put on a CEO forum in May of last year. I'm usually giving some sort of a talk somewhere. And this is good for the US Asia Center because it keeps us in the minds of people and it lets us have lots of sources of information about what's happening now. Uh, I'm looking forward to speaking to the Prime Minister's Office of Australia in a couple of weeks, along with their Chief Science Officer. And um, I'm also looking forward to going to Stuttgart to give some lectures for this uh, Fraunhofer Affiliated Institute of Management Education, which um, I've been speaking to them for about seven years annually, but the last two years have been Zoom. We're also, you know, I'm also able to be engaged in some kind of important activities. The High Level Forum is an association of regional innovation systems. Besides being on the steering committee, I chair a working group that includes Shinchu and uh, Scuba and Bangkok, the Eastern Economic Corridor and also uh, the Ruhr Valley and 
Edmonton, Alberta, and Grenoble, and this year, Paris. So they're all in, in my working group on international supply chains. And I'm on the National University Evaluation Committee for Next, and on the Program Committee for the World Premier International Research Center, and also on the editorial board for the Journal of Cyber Policy. So we're quite active in staying out, and it's only through this kind of network building that we can continue to have the fresh sources of information we need. Uh, so what's happening? It'll be a long time before we have to move away from open innovation. But certainly one of the big focus areas of open innovation now is digital transformation. And that's something that is much bigger <coughs> and deeper than most companies think. Uh, also, this is a year to talk about business external risks, geopolitical events. That's what I'm talking to the Australians about in a couple of weeks. Also, the challenges for innovation and technology development of inflation and the possibility of recession and other reasons for this, this downturn. Plus, we have entered into an era in which ESG is no longer plus alpha. It is absolutely essential for large companies to be considering the social impact and the environmental impact, as well as their governance quality, uh, governance systems. Uh, otherwise, they're toast. So this is an area we will be focusing on. Our autumn seminars will be about new business in Asia, driven by climate, tech, and sustainability. We will do the newest information we can get from Asia about entrepreneurship next spring. We'll continue our classes and seminars. And we are talking with a group about possibly participating in joint programs on international women's leadership. Uh, these would be worldwide programs, some of which would be done here and some of which would be done in other places. And as you see, students are coming back to Stanford. So hopefully from the fall, we'll really feel more like uh, it's back to kind of normal, even if it is sort of a new normal. I'm afraid I've used up my time a little more. So let me introduce our panel. I'm delighted that um, Steve Szynski has agreed to uh, come in and speak to us uh, to lead our panel on the topic of Silicon Valley as a crucial nexus for corporate innovation now and in the future. I am going to do some things that require me making some changes. And once I get rid of the Stanford image, things will go a lot better. You'll be able to see the room. Yes, here we are. So um, let me turn the microphone over to Steve. First of all, uh, Steve was is the past president of SRI International. And SRI was created as a research institute companion to Stanford University. And you can talk a little bit more about that. Steve is also currently on the faculty of the Graduate School of Business here at Stanford and is teaching courses on leadership, management, and entrepreneurship. He's past chairman of the Board of Trustees for Union College of New York and the president's cabinet of California Polytechnic University. Um, he has a family office and he is one of he and his family are founders of the Kalela Foundation which uh, is supporting organizations around the world that provide life-changing experiences for underserved children and young adults. So thank you very much for finding the time. I'll let you introduce the panel now and uh, take it from here. Wonderful, Richard. Uh, uh, hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Great. Uh, Richard, I must say, I got a little bit tired just listening to all the activities that you and your group are involved in. So we'll uh, have to see about energy levels, but uh, fantastic, fantastic service that you're doing to, to, uh, to not only Stanford and, and Asia, but the world. So congratulations and thank you all of that. Um, so uh, as mentioned, uh, 
my job is to head up a panel discussion of Silicon Valley as a crucial nexus for global innovation now and into the future. That's the title. And I really have two really great uh, panelists, and I, I'll, it'll be a pleasure to moderate. Of course, um, I hope you all recognize that this is Silicon Valley, and uh, anyone want to guess at what we're staring at here? What building? What building is that? The spaceship. The spaceship for what? NASA or <laughs> Apple? For Apple. That's the Apple spaceship. Okay, that's uh, that's the new building, our new ish building. So uh, and picture is looking on. This is me. First, I'll do a, a, a follow-on introduction. So thank you. I'm, um, I've had quite a career here in Silicon Valley. Uh, I've run several companies, been uh, in the process of not only starting up companies that have been successful, but also industries that have, that have uh, taken off and been successful, namely in the semiconductor capital equipment industry, uh, the voice messaging industry, uh, web uh, 2.0, Industry, we're now entering Web 3.0, and um, uh, the first uh, enterprise artificial intelligence-based uh, application uh, called Resume, Resumex, matching open job requisitions with uh, with resumes. Um, I've been in venture capital. I was a partner with uh, Early Bird Ventures here in in uh, Silicon Valley, running the Palo Alto office for a few years. And as Richard mentioned, we have our own family office now, where we do investing and advising. Uh, with both uh, venture capital firms as well as uh, private companies throughout the world. Um, and also involved with a number of not-for-profits. I'm sure some of you might recognize Yosemite Conservancy. I got my MBA here at, at Stanford and um, I've been teaching now on entrepreneurship. I'm one of the few, few lecturers at, at the business school who teaches specifically on international entrepreneurship and venture capital. So as you know, most uh, Stanford's known for entrepreneurship, but uh, many of the instructors who happen to be um, ex-VCs or uh, executives with companies talk about Silicon Valley, but it's very different in Santiago and Sao Paulo and Cape Town and Warsaw and Singapore and other places. And that's our specialty and we write a lot of cases on that. So it's a real pleasure to, to interact with a lot of international students. And I'm going to do. I'm going to introduce um, Sean Randolph um, formally in um, when I'm done, and also Peter Marcatulio. Sean heads up the um, Bay Area Research Council, uh, and he's here with um, some special sort of breaking news. I think it's really hot off the press uh, to talk about uh, what's going on in the Bay Area in terms of research, uh, both local research of local firms as well as international firms. And Peter. Um, is my successor at uh, at SRI International. He heads up all the commercial and international activities and is well versed on all the new things that are going on at SRI, not just in research, but also in working with large corporates like many that are represented here. So I'll do an introduction for a few minutes. Um, then I'm gonna turn it over to Sean for his introductory comments and then practical applications we have a researcher and we have a, a practitioner here uh, on the panel, Peter, and then we'll have some time as a panel and prepared some really, really tough questions. I'm sure you can think of some tough questions as well for our panel. So uh, uh, the idea here is, is that Silicon Valley is still the, the best model um, for innovation worldwide. I've traveled pretty extensively except, except for the past year and a half to two years. And um, the Valley is really quite the ecosystem for innovation, as I think you all know. You can all read much quicker than I can, I can uh, read out to you uh, all the different aspects that I uh, put down here. We did a study for the World Economic Forum on what constitutes uh, special innovation ecosystems. Silicon Valley came out number one. There are a bunch of others as well. And many uh, uh, cities and regions of the world are starting to move up and putting some pressure on Silicon Valley, but they're still number one because of all the grade A um, um, grades that they get with uh, the aspects um, and attributes here that I've mentioned. Now I've called out in yellow three uh, particular firms uh, that I'd like to just uh, quickly mention. Of course, Stanford University, as you well know, you're taking a course here and uh, are associated in some fashion with Stanford, has many, many programs. This happens to be one 
fantastic program, but the business school, the engineering school, at the med school, the law school, and so forth, you can't help but uh, uh, come in contact with a number of different seminars, speeches, panels, and so forth that are going on every day. And of course, Stanford is responsible for many, many famous startups, Nobel Prize winners, and so on. Uh, SRI International, well known, uh, formed in 1946 at Stanford University, spun out in 1970, I think it is, right, Peter, um, as an independent not for profit. Um, Stanford goes back, uh, SRI goes back all the way to the, to the, inter to the internet, to um, the first computer mouse, um, many, many innovations over the years. Uh, most recent, famous, very famous one is, of course, Siri that was spun out from, from, uh, from SRI. Peter uh, is going to spend a little bit more time talking about SRI, some of the new things that are going on, as well as the different programs that are going on that I think you'll find interesting. The third one, it's not represented here, but I, I thought I'd uh, throw it out there because it's so famous is Palo Alto Research Center, <clears throat> otherwise known as PARC. It's being, it's now owned by um, Xerox, we call it Xerox PARC, but PARC is, is being transformed because of all the interest in new ventures and so on into a venture studio, end to end, and it's working with entrepreneurs, research scientists, industry disruptors, bringing entrepreneurs in, working on such things as additive and digital manufacturing, Internet of Things, clean tech, and a variety of other things. They're all, you know, been around for a long, long time. I think Park was formed in 1970 and so on. And so we've all been around and still very active and keep refreshing ourselves, repotting ourselves. So since HP was, was founded in 1938, Silicon Valley still flourishes. It's amazing to me when you think about it that if you count as Silicon Valley the sort of first official start, maybe. Of, of Silicon Valley, where uh, Dean Turman funded two students, Hewlett and Packard, and they were in this famous garage in Palo Alto. It's now become a museum. You know, what is that? Something like 84 years ago, something like that. Is that right? That Silicon Valley has been around. And it's still a standard there, which is very, very unusual. If you take a look at the, the, uh, the S&P 500, you'll be amazed by how many companies have turned over in the S&P 500 and have become obsolete. We have a slide, I won't show it, that shows that these are all dinosaurs. They've, they've, uh, they've just uh, never worked on their innovation. We have at SRI, we have at, at, at uh, Stanford, and of course, Park as well. So corporates still want to have an innovation outpost in Silicon Valley. And this was a very recent article um, by um, a blog um, and journal in, in Europe, Sifted. So Silicon Valley knows best how to do startups. That's why they want to happen. So what do I mean by that? Well, you know probably all of this. Entrepreneurs who are visionary, have expert, agile, have the passion and the fortitude and the resilience that's necessary to break through and create a, a, a high potential startup. Of course, in, in the US, we have great, great markets, customers who are willing, early adopters, try things out. And of course, we're very, very interested as VCs in breakthrough ideas and innovations, disruptive, something that really changes things. After all, one of the, one of the uh, key phrases of, uh, of Stanford is change the world in some fashion. So an open secret about the Valley though is cultural support for innovation, the startup culture. I'll name four aspects that I think are important. First, even kids who start off in grammar school are learning how to start up a company by their parents, by the teachers, by forming teams. This, uh, this uh, group of, of young women, there's a CEO, a CTO, a chief sales officer is very important, of course, and, uh, and even the chief uh, engineering officer for their product. Um, and they get going very early on and learn about things. So they get the, they get the, uh, the idea and the, and the passion very early on. But engineers, scientists, managers all aspire to do something independently. Success is rewarded not only financially, but also through prestige and through recognition. Failure is not punished. It's what you can learn from to do better than your next job. So it's not uh, such a, uh, a desperate thing like you see in some countries where if you fail, you can actually, in some countries, you can actually be thrown in jail. You'd never get a job again in that country. Uh, in Silicon Valley, 
It's not like it's an attaboy that you failed, but you can learn from that and you can move on. And of course, people move around quite a bit. Um, even John Hennessy, the former president, started up companies, um, left Stanford, ran companies, came back, and of course became president. So you can do that here in the Valley. The career shifting is amazing. Um, there's a lot of detail on this slide, but I just want to point out really the headlines because we, I believe that we're living in this new Renaissance era, the era of innovation. Um, 959 unicorns, at least as of uh, the end of last year, maybe they've gone down a little bit given the slump in the economy, but, um, but nonetheless, uh, up 69% year over year, 69% year over year. Venture capital funding, only 10 or 12 years ago, it was about $100 billion throughout the world. Last year, it reached $621 billion. 300 of that, about half of that, came in to Silicon Valley. The other half was the rest of the world. You should all be happy about the fact that 36%, the second largest area, was in Asia. So a lot of things happening in Asia in the, the, the countries that I had mentioned you know, previously, China, of course, Japan now uh, a little bit late to the party, but um, picking up very, very rapidly, Singapore, Vietnam, and Indonesia are really on fire these days, as well as India. Some interesting trends as well, two of which I'll circle here. One is, take a look at all the, the publicly disclosed global M&A transactions, or exits, as VCs talk about. 10,792 worldwide. That's a growth of 58% over the previous year. And I've got a, um, a graphic in a couple of minutes that I'll show you that I think is very, very important about that particular statistic. Also, take a look at $105 billion of that $611 billion that I mentioned, 105 has gone into Silicon Valley. So there's a lot of money still here, ready to invest in the right startups. Now, um, my research indicates that multinational corporations are deploying multiple strategies to innovate these days. The first strategy is a pretty traditional one. Um, IBM follows this quite a bit. They have their own research labs. Um, they start from very basic research all the way through development into innovation, and eventually it finds its way out into the marketplace through their distribution chain. Partnering with other R&D organizations is another way where you don't have as much research in your own uh, facilities, in your own company, but you may go to an SRI, you may go to uh, a Berkeley, you may go to a park and see if you can uh, partner with them in some fashion. Another way is to avoid um, um, R&D organizations and R&D entirely and simply buy and license uh, proven technology, not proven products, but proven technology. So some, number three, is about licensing technology. Number four, however, is about um, working with small startups and even larger companies, but generally startups, on their proven products. Technology, remember, of and by itself is not valuable. It's only valuable if it can be in a product that can be commercialized or is being commercialized. So this is an infamous phrase called product market fit. Is the product fitting in with the marketplace? Are the customers buying? And, and really wanting to hold on. So uh, companies are doing that. And of course, what we're seeing, you just saw that, that, that uh, statistic that now big companies are aggressively acquiring new ventures just who are doing well and saying, no more r and I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend my money instead on buying new companies, bringing them in. I have talent that I bring into my company. I have ideas. I have a new product and I have maybe some new customers as well. So let me just spend a little bit more time because I really think that this is an important point before I turn it over to Sean and to Peter. This is an interesting chart. Um, for the most part, it's been kind of flat, the number of M&A transactions over the past five, 10, even 15 years. However, just in the last year or so, you can see this take a big jump of 58%, the one that I showed earlier. I'm wondering whether this is a new trend where we're gonna see a lot more in the way of M&A, maybe less in R&D, who knows? We're gonna be tracking this, so very carefully. Another is this phenomenon 
of corporate venture capital. A corporate venture capital is a bit different than venture capital. It's a where a corporation actually sets up maybe an independent company, maybe an independent division, and dedicates from its treasury some money to put into some, quote, hot startups. Intel Capital was one of the very, very first to get into this business, and it's been quite lucrative for Intel over the years. I think we may even have one or two people from Intel on this uh, particular call, so I'm sure they would agree. <clears throat> Back in 2010, though, CVC was only about 11% of all the venture capital. And you can see that back in 2010, only venture capital throughout the world was 54 million, excuse me, billion dollars. But take a look now through 2021. This slide only shows Q, up to th Q3 of 2021. If I had Q4, it would have been that 611 number that I've been mentioning, billion dollars in all of venture capital. And now corporate venture capital is now 21% of, um, of all of venture capital. It's growing at 30, what is that? 31% per uh, compound, compound and annual growth rate per year versus venture capital, which is growing astoundingly high, 22%, but CBC is even growing more. So between CBC and acquisitions, let's just follow how multinationals do out in the marketplace and where they see the benefits of the ROIs for the money that they're spending. Why is CBC growing so fast? Well, there's a lot of detail on this, on this page, but I'm just gonna point you out to just a couple of uh, points. One is there's been a dramatic shift turning to startup investment that complements, as I've been saying, R&D investing, okay? Maybe not eliminating it, but complementing it. The second is that um, they're going very early now into, large, to, into startups. They used to be in the late stages, but now they're, they want to have access to the technology very early on. And so of course, the financing, it's now up to 25% of their financing are at the seed stage, not at the growth stage. And finally, they've taken a look at the statistics and the financials. And I don't know if you've noticed, but venture capital is returning these days much, much better than it did 10 or 15 years ago. And it's not unusual to see 20%, 30%, even 40 or 50% IRR. And if normal VCs can get this, and so can CVCs, and they're looking at it from just from a pure financial standpoint. So for many reasons, CVC is increasing. Finally, why do uh, multinationals select the Valley as a first choice to partner up? Well, probably pretty easy for you to understand that it's an easy ecosystem here. People in the Valley get it. They understand how to work with the multinational. Uh, multinational is looking for technology, is looking for a startup that's just getting going in product market fit and so forth. And even the younger entrepreneurs and so on understand the vernacular, understand what large companies may be interested in and so forth. Not true necessarily in emerging economies where you really, if you're a multinational, you really have to be disciplined, this, uh, this little startup, you have to set guidelines, you have to set routines and so forth. More friction when, when, when you're dealing uh, with, with these locations. So after 84 years of HP's beginnings, we're left with this question that somebody asked in 19, excuse me, in 2020. Now that we can work from basically anywhere in this globe, is Silicon Valley relevant anymore? And how relevant? So I'll leave you with that question kind of hanging because we're going to ask the panelists that in about 15 minutes or so. I'm Sean Randolph. I'm with the Barry House Economic Institute. And we are basically a think tank on the economy of the Bay Area, including Silicon Valley. Those are basically the same thing today. Bay Area, San Francisco, Silicon Valley. It's all merged together as one gigantic innovation platform. And we focus on, uh, in my particular work focuses on uh, the evolution of the innovation ecosystem here, and especially how companies and organizations from other countries play into our economy and how we participate in the innovation economies and support the innovation economies in other parts of the world. And I think the question that Steve posed a moment ago about is Silicon Valley still relevant, especially if it's still relevant globally, 
uh, that's a nice lead in to my, my presentation. Uh, because we're actually attempting to answer that right now. There's a lot of ways you could approach that question, but one of them is what has happened with the global presence here in the Bay Area since the pandemic began? So we've known for a very long time that uh, the international presence, the, the corporate uh, venture funds, the corporate innovation offices, the governmental presence has really been central to the DNA of this region. It wouldn't be what it is without the international engagement. So we know that almost half, about 40, 5% of all the startups that have been founded in technology companies in the Valley have been founded by people who came from other countries, especially from India and China, but really from everywhere in the world. We know that almost half of the unicorns uh, here and the pentacorns and the decacorns, uh, that whole spectrum uh, mm -hmm. have people who are born in other countries as their CEOs, uh, as well as senior executives. Um, and that people from other countries heavily populate our graduate departments at the universities in computer science, engineering, and other fields. So that's been the case for a long time. When the economy basically physically shut down in March and April of 2020, uh, these international entities physically shut down too. Like we, all of us went home. All of us transition as quickly as we could to online activity. And then last fall and through this year, things started to come to life again. People started to come back into offices or to show up for meetings. And so we, we know that in that period, there was a lot of attention given to the fact that, well, some tech workers had left the Bay Area because it's up to cheaper, or they have more space they can live in. There's been some high profile media coverage to some well-known tech companies relocating their headquarters outside of California, outside the Bay Area. So we wanted to ask, well, what's happened to this enormous international community? Are they still here? Because we know that that cohorts of startups from around the world were not able to come to accelerators here. We know that the business executives were not able to visit uh, their corporate innovation offices. In many cases, we just couldn't fly, period. Um, and we know that some people went home and couldn't get back. Um, so the question is, so what does this universe of organizations look like today, uh, May 2022, and is Silicon Valley still as central or as important to the global strategies of these organizations and governments and countries as it was before? Uh, so the answer, bottom line, I'll give you up front, we think it's pretty encouraging. The answer is yes. Uh, there have been some changes, but uh, to get to that conclusion, we conducted over about four months uh, internet searches to try to figure out who was open and who, who had closed. Um, a lot of interviews, a lot of online questionnaires with companies and organizations we know to ask, well, what happened? You know, what, what is your strategy? What are your plans? And so I'm, I'm going to give you the sort of the, the bottom line on, on what we found. So first, these international entities here, it, it's a large and very, very community. You, you have the diplomatic community here where the Bay Area is home to more overseas government offices, consulates than anywhere in the United States outside of Washington, DC, New York. It's an enormous number. Um, there's also a large number of government sponsored trade and innovation organizations uh, coming from many countries that are not consulates, but they're specifically there to sort of connect their national economies and their governmental entity into the innovation system here. Uh, that includes uh, government science organizations from countries like Australia, countries like, like Ireland. Uh, it includes universities from all around the world that are connecting here around technology in particular. It includes a large number of corporate R&D centers and corporate innovation offices as well as sovereign wealth funds and a large number of corporate venture funds and a lot of accelerators that have uh, sponsorship primarily from other countries to help their startups get connected and, and, and grow from Silicon Valley. So that's the universe we've been looking at. Uh, so from the survey findings, one of the things we found that almost everybody who was on the map and active before the pandemic is still here and on the map and active and many are actually expanding. 
uh, locally based incubators and accelerators that work with startups. Now, these are the ones we know, the ones we surveyed. We know there's some out there we haven't found or we haven't captured, but these, I think the findings would be consistent uh, either way. Uh, all the accelerators that we, we know and work with are open and are bringing people back. Uh, they say, we're gonna be online in the future too. We're not gonna back away from that, but we're starting to bring people physically back to Silicon Valley. Um, there's a lot of European uh, sponsored incubators, accelerators, these government offices, uh, almost everybody close to 100% uh, are still uh, open and running and, and many are growing. Uh, the only place where we saw any notable attrition was in the European corporate offices where there was a drop of about 27%. Uh, we're not sure why, but that may or may not be an accurate number in the end because we came across a pretty significant number of European companies that are new to the region that arrived during the pandemic. So some that were here before were gone, but a whole lot of new ones have come. So in the end, uh, probably the vast majority of the European offices are here uh, as well with the influx of, of quite a number of new ones. Uh, European corporate venture funds, uh, almost all of them still here. A couple, one closed, but everybody else that we know uh, is operating. The Chinese are a little bit different. Uh, we've seen a shrinkage of the Chinese presence here since 2017, but not primarily for economic reasons or opportunity. It's really good for political reasons. You know, the US-China relations have taken a turn for the worse. They're continuing to get worse. And there's just a lot more barriers than there were uh, three, four, five years ago uh, to investment from China here and to technology cooperation with China. And that explains, I think, the, 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 the drop in the Chinese corporate presence in the corporate and the government accelerators. But you know, they're still here in every kind of way. But I, I think that growth has stopped in the case of China. And that applies to the Chinese corporate venture funds as well. Uh, I think the impressive story to me was Japan. Uh, we counted, and we probably don't have everybody, uh, at least 80 uh, corporate ventures here from Japan, with everybody uh, being <clears throat> up, up and running and continuing to operate. That applied as well to the corporate venture uh, funds that we found from Japan and then other countries. Uh, <coughs> there is a very significant presence here from, from Korea. And uh, what they're telling me is they're expanding. New companies are coming in from Korea the last two years. And their innovation center that works for startups uh, says they, they can't wait to, to come here again. They're just waiting for the door to open and they are. Their cohorts are showing up here again for Korea. Same thing with the Indians. Uh, major presence of, uh, presence of technology, IT companies primarily, but industrial as well for India. Uh, they're open and, and in many cases expanding. And then a lot of other countries, Australia, Canada, Singapore, the Philippines, uh, even Mexico now uh, have the same, same kind of a presence on a smaller scale. And then there's the software growth funds. So the takeaway from this was that um, that huge presence that was here before the pandemic is almost entirely still here. And while some have left, actually new players have come in and on balance, that presence is, is actually growing. Uh, oh, there we go. Uh, so we, we talked to a lot of people, and just, there was a little bit more color to that. Um, just about everybody went online, like all of us did. Um, and as these companies' activity, organizations' activity comes back, uh, it's going to be a hybrid thing. Uh, they are coming back to in-person interaction, uh, but they're, they're keeping the benefits of the online and the hybrid model. So that's universal. <clears throat> um, we saw that some travel from overseas started to come back to these entities, startup cohorts, uh, corporate executives. A little bit in the fall of 2021, more now in the first four or five months of 2022 and accelerating. Um, and we asked these folks, uh, has your core mission changed? Why you're in Silicon Valley? And uh, they all told us, no, it, has, it hasn't changed. A few had reduced their headcount, but the great majority had sustained their headcount, even if they weren't physically open. 
they sustained their budgets from pre-pandemic levels. And quite a few had told us they were actually in the process of increasing their head counts here and increasing their, their budgets here. Uh, some organizations took the opportunity of physically closing to kind of reevaluate, like what are our priorities? How do we go about doing what we do in the future? Um, everybody said uh, that they are strongly committed to the region and believe as much as ever, if not more so, that it's important to be here in, in the Silicon Valley. Um, there was less opportunity in the last two years for networking, which is really important part of the model here, but a lot of optimism that these live networking opportunities are, are, are returning. Um, and also thinking about where business opportunity is and investment, uh, we know that there's been some you know, spread of tech entrepreneurs around the country now, development in cities like Phoenix or Nashville or Miami or, or, or Austin. We asked people what they thought about that. And the general answer was, yes, there, there, there will be more investment opportunities around the US, which I think is a really good thing. You can find more now in the future in Austin or Dallas or Miami or someplace, but the, the Bay Area will be central. It is the first stop, it's the first place to come. And then you can look around after you've been in the Bay Area. And what's the driver? The driver is digitalization. Uh, there's a almost universal perception that uh, digitalization is transforming and will transform virtually every industry. And the script for how that happens is being largely written here. And that to really, to be competitive in the future and not be a dinosaur, that you need to be here as part of the process and part of that conversation. And that applies not just to corporations, but to governments, where we found a lot of governments are actually growing their presence here, bringing in more research organizations, bringing in more universities, building bigger platforms to enable their companies to come in here because they want to enable them to be more competitive, especially digitally. But also, a lot of these governments now have developed pretty aggressive digital policies at the national level. And what they tell us is that as that has happened, it, it is even more important for them to be here too because this is part of that conversation about where digital policy and regulations goes in the future. So um, I'll run through these next couple of slides very, very fast, but this is our, our best map at the moment of, of who is here uh, in these different categories that I mentioned in May, 2022. So these are accelerators uh, that extensively support as part of their business model startups coming from overseas. And uh, these are mostly well-established, but uh, they're all, they're all going strong and they're bringing back their people. I talked to folks at 500 startups, it's actually called 500 Global now, and they're, they're gonna be expanding. They're, they're opening new offices and expanding globally as fast as you can imagine. Um, likewise, plug and play. Um, these are European sponsored incubators of accelerators and government innovation offices. And you can see just a huge range of that. Places you wouldn't imagine, you know, Latvia and Bulgaria, Estonia, as well as you know the Irish, the Spanish, the uh, uh, Italians, the Norwegians. Uh, it's really the whole spectrum from across uh, from across Europe here. The European Union is going to establish an office here, the only office outside the national capital of the world uh, later this year. Uh, the European Institute of Technology is expanding here, and so we're seeing a real interest and, and an intensifying interest by these governments and government entities and what's happening here. Uh, these are the European corporate innovation offices and R&D centers that we're aware of. This is where there was a little attrition among those who were here before the pandemic, but we think that gap has been largely filled or more than filled by new European corporates uh, arriving. Uh, and very often there are corporate venture funds affiliated with those entities. Often they're co-located, sometimes they're different, but you can see quite a spectrum of, of European CDCs in the region. Um, I mentioned the Chinese. Uh, these are the companies and entities that we know are here. A lot of have government affiliations, some of them don't. Um, it's a smaller list than there was in 2016, whereas I mentioned uh, it's not because it's 
any less interest in working here in technology that it's just a lot harder to do uh, given uh, governmental policies uh, in the US and regulation on in foreign investment coming from China. And the same story for the Chinese venture funds. They all have some kind of government connection. But, uh, it's fewer than there was in the past, some have left in the last four years, but again, primarily for, uh, for reasons caused by policies. Um, the big story I think is Japan. This really was a big surprise to me. We, we had worked in one way or the other, or got to know maybe 30, 35 Japanese corporates here. Uh, we found actually that there were more like 80 um, and that uh, they're uh, up and running and active. And I think just the scale of the Japanese presence really it, it exceeds by far any other single country and, and it exceeds the scale uh, as well of, if you put all the Europeans together. It takes a little bit of a different format here than the Europeans, but uh, if you just would count the number of companies, uh, by, by far it's really a, a, a Japanese show. And of course, uh, Japanese and, and Japan related uh, corporate venture. And not to forget the Koreans, I, I'm told by our friends at the Korean Innovation Center that this is far less than the number of actual Korean entities here. They're going to tell us who the people who they know that we didn't capture are. But they, these are major companies like Hyundai and Coupon, Samsung, but also the Korea Innovation Center, which is uh, welcoming back startup cohorts and, and they're planning to not really act with aggressive program this year. And then the Indians, all the major Indian IT firms are here uh, with R&D centers, customer uh, innovation centers, and they're uh, enthusiastic as well. And then a lot of other countries, you know, uh, different forms, Israel, Singapore, Australia, the Philippines, Canada, even Baja California, Mexico, uh, is opening up here uh, in the next month or two, and then up in Walton. So I think that the, the, the bottom line that, that we've taken away from this is that you know there, there are issues in the Bay Area for sure. We, we are a really expensive place to be, expensive place to locate people. Um, housing is a really tough issue for everybody. And transportation congestion is not good. It hasn't gotten any better, really. Um, and for a variety of reasons, a few tech companies, you know, more than in the past but some tech companies have chosen to relocate. Uh, however, we're, we're seeing that um, at the international level, the level of interest and commitment being here has actually grown in the pandemic. And I think the answer to that, the reason is that the pandemic really accelerated everything digitally. This was going on before and it just shot it out of the camera. And I think the recognition of that has really you know, heightened the, the interest and the focus on being part of the, uh, the economy here in Silicon Valley. Perfect, Sean, that was that was uh, fabulous. And this is all breaking news. You just issued a press release on this. Uh, we we weeks issued ago? it last Wednesday. Okay. And, uh, uh, with with the new German Center for uh, <laughs> Research and Innovation, the drug maker here in the Bay Area, bringing with it a whole gaggle of, 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 of European or rather German university research entities, uh, all uh, the kind of, uh, you know, draw bank or be part of the economy. Okay, well, thank you very much. Very interesting uh, stuff. It's it's good to know, at least uh, from your end, that Silicon Valley is not going to dry up anytime soon. It's not going <laughs> And by the way, when I talk to corporate venture people, not corporate, local venture people, I ask them this question. They all say, you know, Silicon Valley, you know, it is going to remain absolutely central for them. It, it's not fading away at all. Maybe some of their investment gets distributed more around the U.S. <clears throat> Great, uh, but they they don't see. They don't tell me. Uh, they tell me they don't see any real diminution at all in in the interest and the focus on the innovation opportunities they're finding here. All right. Well, we'll have to find that journalist who wrote that article uh, about uh, the. Uh, the end of life. Or, or so that so. article has been written many times in decades. Yeah. It's always wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just <love> <laughs> All right, I'm going to introduce Peter Marcatulio now. Um, Peter's been with SRI for a long, long time. He's a graduate of Lehigh University uh, back east, and he found his way here when he fell in love with what's going on out here. So uh, take it away, Peter. Uh, he's the practitioner of the group. As you can tell, Sean is the one who's 
and his organization is, is watching over the Bay Area and what's happening in the Bay Area. But go ahead, Peter, tell us, tell us what's new at SRO. Great, thanks, Steve. Uh, and thanks for, for having me. Um, so uh, again, I'm Peter Martulio. I run a group called Global Partnerships, which was Steve helped name, uh, which is really the part of SRI that has uh, interaction with uh, commercial technology commercialization and primarily large corporations. So and I'll give you some examples of some of the folks that we've worked with. Um, as Steve mentioned, Silicon Valley kind of started around 1938 with HP, and, and SRI didn't start much later than that in 1946. So we were founded by Stanford with sort of the primary mission to kind of be a mini Silicon Valley before there was a Silicon Valley, right? So the mission of SRI is to basically deliver world-changing technologies to make the world healthier, safer, and more productive. Um, so, you know, for the sake of time, I don't want to go too deeply into a bunch of topics, um, but I think it's important to share what SRI is doing and what we've done because it is really a microcosm of uh, Silicon Valley in general. And so as, as practitioners, as we continue to engage with research, with corporations, with investors, you know, we're constantly adapting, but we're also sort of understanding and shifting with the changes that are happening in Silicon Valley. So one of the first things I always like to ask folks is, have you ever heard of SRI? Do you know what that is? Yeah. So we have a pretty good reputation in Japan, but in many parts of the world and in many parts of the US, we're not that well known. So again, we were founded by Stanford 46, uh, 75 years ago, um, now independent, mission-driven nonprofit, right? So. Uh, all those words are important. Independent means we're not a corporate lab. We're not a national lab. We're no longer a university lab. We're truly independent. We can work on whatever challenges meet our mission that we can find partners, collaborators, funding agencies, whatever the case might be to deliver. And, and uh, nonprofit means that we're never going to compete with the folks we work with. We develop technology, we solve problems. Uh, and then we try to deliver through a variety of different channels to those partners that we work with. And that could be government, that could be companies, and that can be investors. And so I'll, I'll give you an example of that. And the kinds of area we, areas we work in are the kinds of areas that you would associate with Silicon Valley, right? Human augmentation, which is thinking about all the different ways that we interact with technology, automation and infrastructure, all the different things you can do with technology, and then healthcare, of course, how do we make the world uh, healthier? Uh, we're located, uh, headquartered here in Silicon Valley, Menlo Park, not far from Stanford. Uh, we have a significant presence on the East Coast now uh, when we merge with the old RCA labs, Sarnoff labs. Uh, so we have a large presence in Princeton, New Jersey, um, and a few offices. And if you notice, all those locations are co-located with major research universities. So Ann Arbor, Boulder, Princeton, of course, Cambridge, uh, New York, et cetera, San Diego. Um, what's probably unique in there is that we actually have an office in Tokyo, uh, and we've been uh, delivering and working with industry in Japan for almost 60 years. Next year, we'll be celebrating 60 years of working in Japan. So you can think of SRI as kind of, again, filling that mission that's very similar to Silicon Valley's mission which is there's great science that's being done all over the place. We have lots of great institutions here in Silicon Valley, Stanford, of course, Berkeley, UCSF, not far from us in San Diego, uh, and of course, places like SRI and uh, the big research labs at the big tech companies. And then you have companies that are primarily focused on delivering products and services where they are more users of technology or acquirers of technologies or licensors of technologies. And in between, there's something called the valley of death, right? So the valley of death is where you have a lot of great ideas, but not all of them kind of cross that valley to make it into products. And that's really what Silicon Valley does and really what SRI's role was when it was created is help transition technology from the lab to the marketplace so that it can have an impact on the world. So that's really our role. Um, there's probably a lot of things that you touch in every day that you don't realize originated at SRI. But again, it mirrors the history of Silicon Valley from the original mouse, windows, hypertext, cut and paste, all the things that we think of as personal computing, which by the way, were eventually transitioned to Park, which eventually transitioned into Apple, 
right? So we can trace a direct lineage there, and of course, many other companies since then, to the very first message on the ARPANET, which was the predecessor to the internet, to also the very first message on the internet, uh, about five or six years later, to all kinds of technologies that we use today, like virtual private networks, or autonomous systems, or robotic surgery, or Siri, or as I like to say, the most important technology is the stripe on the football field, or uh, for those of you that follow other sports, the offsides line on a soccer pitch, right? So all of those graphics that you see in sports were originally developed at SRI and then spun out into companies uh, to be deployed uh, in the marketplace. We're organized around technology areas, again, that fit very similar to Silicon Valley. So computer and uh, information technologies, sensors and systems and, and micro devices, biosciences, and then recently uh, innovation and strategy. In fact, I'll talk a little bit about some of our, our new work in uh, innovation and strategy with our recently launched Nomura Center. But we were also selected by the US government to run the Quantum Economic Development Consortium. That's a, a public-private partnership between industry, government, national labs, and universities. It was exclusively for US companies until just a few months ago. Uh, but we've recently expanded, so now we can work with Canada, the UK, New Zealand, Australia, Norway, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, and Japan. So we, those are the only countries that we're allowed to partner with for the QEDC. And in fact, the, 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 the director of that will be visiting Japan in the next month, working with the new QSTAR initiative in Japan on quantum technology. Went the wrong direction. Uh, and again, I mentioned we work a lot with industry. And again, these programs mirror a lot of the things that you see in Silicon Valley. I noticed in Richard's slide that he had Sajo san uh, there from Woven Planet. Well, uh, we like to think that maybe we helped him get his start or at least helped him accelerate because prior to his role at Toyota, he was with Yamaha and uh, was our sponsor for the Motobot program. And so we spent a lot of time with him. Uh, uh, and that program and his team, and he was a real champion for innovation, both technology innovation, but also corporate innovation back into <laughs> Yamaha, and then now uh, Toyota, and Toyota spit off uh, Woven Planet. But we work across a wide range of, of companies and industries, again, delivering technology to solve uh, immediate and longer term problems. And again, this mirrors very closely what you see in Silicon Valley. So we have basic research, but we also have applied research, and then we try to find ways to transition that technology so that it can have an impact. And there are many paths. This happens to be transitioning with corporate partners, again, across a wide range of industries, but we also spin out technologies. So we have about 70 companies in our current portfolio. We have our own incubator for our own internal technologies. Uh, we're fortunate that we've had a lot of successful companies like Intuitive Surgical and the Medical Robotics or Siri, uh, or uh, companies like Nuance, which was recently acquired by Microsoft, uh, but many, many other companies, 33% of our companies have been acquired uh, and had successful exits or been uh, IPOs, and most of the rest are still active. So very few that have had to, that have had to close across, again, the same range of technologies that we see in Silicon Valley. So in many ways, we have, again, a microcosm of how Silicon Valley operates across the entire spectrum, from the earliest stages of research to trying to apply that research to industry and global challenges, and then to transition it through licenses, but also through startups and a couple of other vehicles. So I am gonna just finish with, during the course of our engagements over many, many years, we have seen certain patterns successful and unsuccessful in technology innovation with large corporations. Um, we were fortunate enough to start a partnership with Nomura a couple of years ago, uh, really with the idea of helping to expand innovation practices across Japanese industry through you know, their contacts. And we thought it was a good fit, right? So a technology-centric organization like SRI with a sort of business and finance-centric organization like Nomura, both trusted partners with, our, with corporations, both here and in Japan, with a tech-focused but with uh, the mission to really provide the partners in that program with hands-on real-world experience in 
understanding what innovation means, but also in delivering it back to their companies. So we've created a program to share best practices from Silicon Valley, but every company that participates also has to have a specific project that they have to enable and then deliver back to headquarters, right? So that's really important. So it's theory plus practice. And so that's, a, yeah, that's a little bit of overview about SRI, sort of what we do, how it sort of aligns and dovetails with, with Silicon Valley, and then some recent initiatives that uh, sort of uh, mimic some of the topics that we hope to, to cover today. Peter, that was fantastic. Thank you very much. So first question, both of you. Um, you know, we've got an international audience here on Zoom and here in person, and I keep hearing critique, even at Stanford, which is, you walk around Stanford, you think it's quite international, that Silicon Valley is too inwardly focused, meaning that we get consumed with our own bubble here, uh, whether it's Twitter and uh, Elon Musk this day or something else going on another day and so forth, and we're just not really aware or concerned or involved with things outside of Silicon Valley. Now, you two guys are great uh, at today talking because you're you're watching. Uh, Sean, you're watching all these international uh, firms uh, set up operations here. Peter, and you said it yourself, global partnerships, not domestic. What's your view on that? Sean, you go first. Uh, <clears throat> see, I, I say yes, yes and no. Um, okay. I think that you know historically, if you look at the venture industry here, uh, we've had and still have an amazing luxury of, of, of opportunity. That there are so many startups here coming out of the universities, um, and you know, a high proportion of the founders of tech companies in the region are graduates of Stanford or Berkeley. And if we you know add in biomedical, you see San Francisco and others, that the area is saturated with startups and investment opportunities. So historically, if you're a venture investor, you don't have to work very hard to find them. You, you would invest in somebody you could drive to their office. And, and to a degree that, that that's still the case, so because people just come here. So I think that probably makes us a little bit doing a more and more navel gazing than if we were in another part of the world. Um, and it has concentrated a lot of the, of the investment here. I think what may, uh, what is, and there's so much technology being generated by the university. What I think is going on though is, is sort of Stanford or Berkeley or UCF, they don't exist in, in isolation, that they, they have partnerships all around the world on technology research. So it's not as if this place is an island. And we say at the same level, but the corporate focus, the company, the countries where corporations, even a company that does so much internal research like IBM, they have labs all around the world. Will Packard has labs all around the world. And beyond their own corporate wholly owned facility, they have multiple, multiple research partnerships with universities and countries all around the world. So in the sense from the, the R&D standpoint, I think that it's not that the Bay Area is a closed loop at all. It's more this global innovation platform that connects globally to other innovation platforms of, of, around well, the world. That's an interesting point because the media seems to be really local and regional, and maybe that's what people want to read. But you, you know, you seemingly absolutely right on on talking about Stanford, IBM, HP, Intel, all these others who have labs all over the place. Peter, what are you saying? Well, I, I so. I'm going to agree that it's a, a strength and a weakness. Okay. Right? So the uh, the strength is that being a little bit inwardly focused gives us the ability to look at uh, challenges and opportunities without necessarily being uh, constrained by local events or local activities. We really have the freedom here to explore change, making big changes without without constraints, right? So that's the, the positive of being a little bit inwardly focused or maybe not inwardly focused, but a little bit um, disconnected from maybe what's happening uh, globally in other places. The, the, the downside is that you can sometimes, you know, sort of reinforce bad behavior or, you know, we, we tend to have this kind of effect where 
you see a trend and then a lot of people follow that trend, right? But only a few winners come out, right? So, you know, a lot of money goes behind an idea and we just know not all of those are gonna succeed, a few will, right? So, you know, it may not be the most efficient way of, of doing things. But I do think in overall, this is a very international place. We are constantly uh, uh, influenced by not just research, but by the challenges that are being faced globally, right? Silicon Valley isn't addressing Silicon. We're not building products for ourselves, we're building products for the world. Well, I, I would add two things okay, to add to. One would be that um, uh, venture investors are still not looking outside the Bay Area as far as they could. So I think with the last two years of the pandemic, maybe more opportunity, more tech people in other places around the country, venture people here are going to start to look for opportunities around the country. Uh, and that, that's a good thing, but they haven't felt the need to until now, but I think they'll look for where the opportunities are. And the same thing internationally, like right? most of the venture firms here don't invest internationally, but some of them do in a pretty big way. So you, there's a massive venture flow to Israel. Uh, I think the venture There, there are reasons for that. I, there's, there's reasons, oh, not, yeah. enough, not enough time to go through it right now. Maybe you can put us back sometime yeah. and we'll <laughs> talk about it. I, I can give you a lot of reasons as to why. But it'd be a good conversation. You better, you better work. Are they looking globally? Uh, could they be looking more globally than they are now? You know, the places like Mexico and Latin America, where there's a lot of activity going on, a lot more unicorns. Well, our venture companies are participating in a lot of that. Uh, could we be doing more? Yeah. Um, one final question for you guys, because I'm, 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 I'm cutting into their break, which is awfully Thank important, <laughs> <laughs> is um, that, that final question, acid test question, what does Silicon Valley look like 10, 15, 20 years from now? Is this going to be kind of a hub and spoke uh, situation and, and a lot of empty buildings, but you know maybe a headquarters with one person and robots? Uh, and uh, and real people out in in the hinterland somewhere. Tell me, tell me who wants to. You want to, Peter? You want to jump on this one? Sure. So you know, if you look at sort of the trends that started during the pandemic of uh, the ability to have re remote, we actually are doing almost fifty percent of our hiring now outside of Silicon Valley, right? Uh, so we we're just because we can, not because we didn't want to in the past. It was just much more difficult. And so I think that trend will continue, but it is dramatically better when people can come together. It doesn't have to be every day to go, you know, discuss, interact, and try to solve some of these problems. You know, you, you mentioned uh, there's investment activity in Israel. There's investment activity in Boston. If you're talking about robotics or Korea, there's certain types of investment. But you can find all that here and more, right? So yes, we tend to be a little bit inwardly focused, but that's because we have for whatever you can find anywhere else, we can find the same or more here as well. Doesn't mean we shouldn't be looking more broadly. But I do think that Silicon Valley will continue to be sort of the center of the hub with a lot more reach. Okay. Uh, global. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Sure. There wouldn't be a lot to add to that. Uh, we were, we've already been for many years, kind of a, this global platform that connects all around the world. Uh, not the only one, but sort of this point of connection where companies come to find growth capital. Companies come to find technology. Companies come to find uh, uh, people who have experience running startups as, as mentors and, 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 and as, as senior staff. All, all of that together, that's really not changing. But I think the reach will expand as I think partners around the world develop their own systems more rapidly. And we're seeing that all around the world. The number of unicorns in so many different countries, the number of entrepreneurs, it's growing. The amount of venture investment around the world and in the US too, although a fraction of what it is here, it's all growing. That's and faster think, than the US. Yeah. So I think we'll be at the center of that still, but it'll just be a, a process with a much broader reach than it had in the past. Yeah, I just you said it earlier. I think what's important is people here understand how to do this. And so it's still the best place to come to sort of do it in a low friction way. So you may. You may be a team from somewhere else, but if you really want to sort of figure out all the parts, you can still come here. And sessions like this are unique to Silicon Valley. The 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 culture of interacting and sharing and ideating, ideating with everybody globally is really unique here. You wouldn't get a session like this or others in a lot of other parts of the world, even if they're 
startup house, which raises a point, <laughs> which is that uh, if you think about my slides up there, that no place else in the United States is going to replicate that global presence. So you can come here from anywhere, and you can connect to almost anybody in the world and anywhere. And you know, whatever the level of entrepreneurial opportunity you may find elsewhere in the US, uh, I don't think you're ever going to replicate uh, just the density of the international president, presence and the connectivity here you find here. So for product research and development, for yeah. finance, maybe New York, and so on and so yeah. forth. With that, I need to uh, cut things off, but I really want to thank Peter from SRI and Sean, yourself from the Bay Area Research Council for being here. Can we give them a hand? You. And I want to thank you, Steve, for running a really good panel with lots of really interesting information from all three speakers. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, it is five minutes before the hour. We will take a 10-minute break, come back at five minutes after the hour. We have one visiting scholar who could not make it today. He's uh, um, He's on the board of a publicly traded company, and so his life is not his own. <laughs> so uh, we only have five visiting scholar presentations. That'll let us finish up a little bit before the hour, if everybody stays on time. We'll turn off the recording and go off the record for the real discussion for the last 10 minutes before we finally break up today. So uh, I do want to uh, thank our panel now. We will take a break until five minutes after the hour. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Great.